Hi, I'm Tommy Moore, founder of the Bartutsu Lab, and this is Behind the Art. Okay, so like all ginger people, you need to learn how to defend yourself at an early age. Um, so when I was very young, I was really into things like Power Rangers, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And I, I loved all of that stuff. So, so that got me into martial arts and, and I, I started like most kids with judo and with karate. And, and I love that and I love the traditional martial arts. I'm from a big boxing background too, so lots of members of my family box are involved in the boxing scene. So from a very young age I was involved in, in boxing, combat sports and martial arts, which for me has kind of stayed with me for the rest of my life. You know, everything I've done I've tried to balance the martial arts and I love them and I care for them and I think they're really important. And the hard, gritty, get yourself a bloody nose and have a fight, combat sport approach. I've loved both of those things and for every single art I've done throughout my entire life I've balanced the two. So, Pugilism, which is what we call bare knuckle boxing in Bartitsu, is something that's always interested me because I love the martial arts world and I love the boxing world. The bare knuckle boxing or using boxing for, for self-defense, as we do in the Bartitsu lab, is a kind of a natural progression. So you know, if you're looking at the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, people weren't just talking about boxing the sport, they were talking about what was called, it sounds a bit crass, the manly art of self-defense or the sweet science or the noble science. And so the work that I do in the Bartitsu lab is all about self-defense, using combat sports for modern self-defense. So that got me interested in that. But also I'm from a normal competitive amateur boxing background. And I found that those two worlds could come together really interestingly. I've been following the growth of bare knuckle boxing as a, you know, a borderline mainstream sport. And I think that you know, I've kept on top of bare knuckle boxing for self-defense, which we call pugilism, and BKB, the sport or spectator art. These are both things that are really important to me as a martial artist and also a kind of a foundation of what I teach at the club. Okay, so as part of the lots of different martial arts that I get interested in and I explore, there is something called HEMA, Historical European Martial Arts. And essentially that's a revivalist movement looking at old medieval manuscripts, Renaissance manuscripts, and bringing arts back to life. So whether that's long sword, rapier, axe, spear, there's hundreds and hundreds of manuals and guides and treaties that teach you how to defend yourself uh, from the Middle Ages all the way up to the Victorian period. And as part of that, there's a niche area called unarmed HEMA, which looks at things like medieval wrestling all the way through to what we call classical pugilism. So that's studying the bare knuckle boxing, the bare knuckle self-defense of the 17th, 18th and 19th century. Now, a small addendum to that, or something that just takes us into the tip of the modern era, is Bartitsu. So Bartitsu is a martial art created by a man called Edward William Barton Wright. He was a British railway engineer and in the late 1800s he went over to Japan and he studied classical koryu jiu-jitsu. Uh, he brought that back to London at a time of kind of a burgeoning crime epidemic. So people are getting worried about gang violence, kidnapping, there's, there's opium dens, so there's a lot of violence and vice in London at the time. Barton Wright, being a canny businessman as well as a martial artist, saw that a lot of gentlemen were worried about being attacked. To, you know, the idea of social order was starting to, to collapse, you know, especially for, for, for gentry. They felt untouchable before, they felt less untouchable now. So what Barton Wright did was he took jiu-jitsu and he combined it with boxing, with savate, which is a French kickboxing art, different European wrestling systems, and he synthesized those mostly combat sports into a holistic self-defense system designed for self-defense on the street. Um, so quite revolution for his time, he's brought together the world's first kind of Victorian MMA. He's brought together grappling, weapons, striking arts from lots of different countries into one holistic syllabus um, 
So from his Bartitsu club in the middle of a very expensive part of London, he trained gentlemen and women, uh, quite revolution for his time teaching women, um, the art of self-defense. So what we know about Bartitsu today predominantly comes from a series of articles and advertorials in gentlemanly magazines. So these are designed to sell the notion of Bartitsu, Barton Wright himself, the man, and attendance at his club. So there's lots of spin, so there's defense on a bicycle, there's using umbrellas, there's using what was very exotic at the time, jujitsu. So again, the things that are in the Bartitsu canon or the official writings of Bartitsu are essentially a collection of magazine articles with limited photography and descriptions. They're designed to sell. Uh, so when you're studying Bartitsu, you take the canon, you take the things that Barton Wright wrote about, but you also need to look at what's called the antagonistics. So those are manuals and guides written by other proponents of fighting arts at the time. So for example, uh, this which is a jiu-jitsu guide from the same period aimed at police officers so we can understand more of the jiu-jitsu that Barton Wright would have been exposed to. There's guides on Spanish knife fencing, you know, so that everything from knife fencing, cane work, jiu-jitsu, you know, they're historical boxing guides by the, by the truckload. So we've got, you know, Tommy Burns' book, you've got Ned Donnelly's book, you know, you've got to imagine that there are probably three to five hundred historical manuals and guides on self-defense that are photographed, that are illustrated, that are described. There's even film footage of, the, of those early periods. So again, bringing all those things together with the canon of Bartitsu allows us to make the art. So each one of these books is fundamental to the creation of Bartitsu originally and in its revivalist form because without those books and guides, all we've got is a couple of magazine articles. So we're thankful to people like Pierre Vigny, to Ned Donnelly, to Colonel Monstry. You know, people that have gone before us and made these books and guides allow us to recreate and remake that art as close as possible to how it might have looked. Okay, so lots of Bartitsu is about historical treaties. It's going back through musty old volumes of Victorian and Edwardian work, and you've got big mustachioed men in poses. You know, you, there's lots of good stuff, really good stuff, and there's lots of shit. And a discerning Bartitsu instructor must be able to filter what is good from what is spin, from what is just plain poor advice. Um, what I wanted to do with my book, uh, Modern Bartitsu, was A, show people the techniques with modern colour photography in a very clear and instructive way. So I've written the book as a training manual. It's not a, it's not a book in a sense that you will read pages and pages. You're meant to pick it up, doodle in it, look at the images, learn the techniques and try it for yourself. You know, it's that kind of, if it was, if it was a thing about cars, it'd be a Haynes manual. You know, it teaches you the practical application of the techniques. There's lots of great stuff out there about the history and the culture and the arts themselves elsewhere. Mine is very much a training book. So it's designed as a modern guide to cut through a lot of the guff. It saves you the time on researching the other Bartitsu canon and the antagonistics, and it gives it to you in a modern way. I will say it's under my lens, you know, there is no singular Bartitsu. This is my take. I take a particularly fighty take on Bartitsu. It's quite aggressive, it's quite primal, it combines combat sports, but with the finality of self-defense. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna smash, cause pain and injury and get gone. So that's what my syllabus is about, and that's what the book kind of countenances. Um, it teaches all the individual elements, so the pugilism, the savat, the weapons work and the grappling, and advises students on how you can meld those together. Because Bartitsu, you need to learn the individual skills, you need to get good at all those ranges and aspects, and then, more importantly, you need to get good at mashing those together in something that suits your body type, your attributes, and the kind of self-defense you want. Because people want lots of different types of, of self-defense. Some people just want the situational awareness. Some people want to know how to do knife defenses, weapon defenses. You can take it as far or as little as you like. Um, but this book is really a technician's guide. Whether you're a beginner or whether you want to set up your own Bartitsu club, this essentially will help you nail the techniques, the attributes and approaches. Now Barton Wright is a really interesting character. We know for certain that he went to Japan and he studied Jiu-Jitsu. But he probably only studied for two years. So how much jiu-jitsu you can learn in those two years as a Westerner in Japan is up for debate. But what we do know is at the time, he knew more than most other Westerners. So he comes back, but he's also a very astute businessman. He knows that self-defense is gonna be very, very marketable at the time. Um, and what I really like about Barton Wright is he brings in people better than himself in every single area. So he brings in wrestlers that are better than him to teach wrestling. He brings in saboteurs and cane fighters that are better than him to come teach that. So while Barton Wright has lots of claims that he's been in lots of street fights and he can use all these weapons and knows all these systems, that's a bit of marketing spin in my opinion. Um, what he is very revolutionary in doing is having the humility as an instructor to bring in better instructors. 
So Barton Wright's job really is the great aggregator. If you go to his Academy of, of, of Arts, essentially you are learning boxing, wrestling, jiu-jitsu, stick fencing. Barton Wright, once, once he knows you know that stuff, he'll weave and knit that together for you as a civilian system of self-defense. So I think his greatest work and his greatest achievement is not as an outstanding martial artist in any area, but someone that can weave in the best of combat sports and martial arts into a system of self-defense. That's his job, keeping you safe. So I think he did a very good job of he that. He aggregates all these martial arts, but he's also a really poor businessman at the end. You know, he charges too much for his lessons. His lead instructors go off and make more money doing shows. So his jiu-jitsu instructors go off and do theater shows where they're beating big, strong Western wrestlers. And that makes a lot of ticket money. You know, that, that makes a lot of impressions on people. So Barton Wright starts to lose instructors. He loses market share, essentially, to what's more exotic at the time, jiu-jitsu. People in London had already seen boxing. They'd already seen Savat. They've seen stick fencing. What they hadn't seen was this big, sexy new thing called jiu-jitsu. And if there are better jiu out there than Barton Wright, the people with the money are going to go there. So, so Barton Wright had a good vision to bring in the best of the martial arts for self-defense, but very poor business choices in his quack medicines, in maintaining and managing the egos of his instructors. And that's why his art fell apart. And, and, and Barton Wright was buried in a pauper's grave, an unknown man. But in reality, he should be, he should be heralded as a, as a founder of bringing Eastern and Western martial arts together. Like in the same way we applaud and laud William Fairburn of you know, the man that trained the commandos that brought together jiu-jitsu and gutter fighting and all those things. Barton Wright was doing that you know, 40 years before he was. So I think he has a rightful place in British and global martial arts history. Bit of a shady character, bit of a suspect past, but makes him more interesting for me. So there are huge numbers of people that I respect in the martial arts industry, but I'd say two that stand out for me probably don't even know how much I respect them. Um, and they're both from karate backgrounds, a million miles away from the stuff that I do. Um, so there is Sensei Steve Lowe and there is Sensei Russ Jarmusty. And these are both tough, hard bastards on the karate scene. They, they do karate as it should be for self-defense with due viciousness and street awareness. And what I really love about both of those, Sensei Steve Lowe, lovely, kind, open, welcoming man, brings lots of people to his dojos. He crowdfunded his own dojo and it's, it's co-owned. So everyone has a stake in that dojo. It's got a, a family feel. So it's a real authentic rendition of karate, which I really respect. Karate is not for me, but I really respect it. And everyone has stake and buy-in to his dojo. It's, it's, it's a brilliant concept. Then you've got someone like Russ Jarmusty, who's a scary, hard-ass bouncer, teaches karate and jiu-jitsu, but by the same token, during lockdown, he's offering free use of his pads. So he's off delivering pads to, to kids in his classes. You know, he's offering scholarships for his kids. It's not like a big chain Taekwondo school. It's real community-based martial arts that combine real authentic stuff, useful stuff for self-defense with community-mindedness, you know, philanthropy. And I, I really value the impact that those kind of clubs can have that make people feel good, they can defend themselves, the art is authentic, and people feel part of a, of a movement, part of something bigger. I really value that. So, what martial arts do I study? Well, loads, to be quite honest. I've always had as my foundation boxing and judo because they're gritty, honest, visceral arts. If it's not working, or if you cock it up, you soon get slammed into the ground or punched into the face. It's a brilliant aid memoir to learning. Being hurt, pain is the best teacher. So those two have been really important to me as my development as a martial artist, but I've also done a huge number of things. So a lot of Jeet Kune Do with Sensei um, Nigel Trotman. I've done a lot of work with Muay Thai as part of Prior Pitcher Birmingham, you know, G JKD, Arnis a Screamer. There's lots of different arts from all over the world. And I think central to me with my Bartitsu hat on is being able to take things from different martial cultures and martial arts using different specialities, so weapons, ground fighting, stand-up grappling, striking. I need to be able to bring all those elements together to make my Bartitsu better. So there's things that I focus on as an instructor, and at the moment that's Bartitsu, and there's things that I focus on as a martial artist, and that can be anything I feel I need to work on. If I need to learn more stick-based weaponry, bladed weaponry, you know, do I need to get my ground fighting better? And that's where I'll dip into other martial arts and other martial artists. You know, cross-training for me is key, it's really important. And Bartitsu is founded upon the principle of cross-training. Yeah, I, I think it's really important that you send your students out into the martial world. You know, your job as an instructor isn't good enough if they can't go into any dojo, any club, and give a fair account of themselves. You know, if I've taught someone boxing or kickboxing or use of a weapon, you know, for example, we do a lot of stick work in Bartitsu, 
If I have a student that's practiced the stick and he goes to an Eskrima club and he can't spar relatively competently, then I've failed as an instructor. Even if the system's different, the delivery platform, a stick, your fists, grappling, is pretty much the same. So I really encourage people to go out there, you know, compete, train, cross-train, spar, learn. It's really, really important. I do it as an instructor and I expect that of my pupils. And, and the original Bartitsa Club was built on that model. You'd spend a lot of time with subject matter experts. So you could learn how to do savat with Pierre Vigny. You could learn how to wrestle with uh, you know, Arnold Chapelon. You know, you can learn different hard skill sets and then Barton Wright himself would bring that together and turn that into a holistic self-defense system. Bring that together and say, right, with all those skills you now have, how do you meld that together for street self-defense? Bearing in mind your own weight, your height, your attributes. You know, it's a very personal system built around you. It was very much a personalized, bespoke approach. So in the martial arts, you get teachers that are technicians, you get teachers which are fighters, and you get to teachers that are hybrids. And I firmly put myself in the hybrid category. You know, I'm lucky to be young enough and fit enough and have enough of a background that I can both teach people, but I can also muck in. You know, I've got upcoming boxing matches soon. I've got upcoming judo matches soon. So I can be active on the scene and, and readying myself for actual testing. Um, but by the same token, I can spend the time to develop my training syllabus and my knowledge and my, my kind of awareness of other art systems and approaches. So I, I think it's important for me to have a fighter technician attitude. There are people that can teach you to fight that have never been in fights themselves. So if you imagine Customato, you know, the main teacher of, of, of Mike Dyson, you know, he's teaching, he's hardly ever boxed. He was a kind of a rubbish boxer, but he could look at you and go, right, you need to move your leg here, move your head here. These are the attributes you need. So I never judge anyone that's a teacher if they can't or haven't fought. For me, it's very important to have that fighting knowledge because a good portion of my students are interested in combat sports and they can't relate to me and I can't relate to them unless I've got that shared knowledge of standing in a ring and being hit in the face or having my face ground into a judo mat. So I think being a technician fighter is important to my approach at the Bartitsu lab, but I also think that for other teachers of Bartitsu, if they're just technicians or just fighters, that's cool, that's completely up to them. You know, it's an open source martial art, you can bring to it whatever you like. There is a larger than you'd think Victorian martial arts community, and much of it springs out of HEMA, the historical European martial arts. It's more popular than ever to pick up Victorian manuals on sabre, on small sword. It, back 10, 20 years ago, everyone wanted to learn long sword and spear and axe. Now people are wanting to learn historical sabre fencing, and that's really cool. And off the back of that kind of Victorian martial culture is the reappreciation of traditional wrestling, traditional boxing, and arts like Bartitsu. So there is a fledgling community that is into Victorian martial arts, um, but I'd say that every time there is a new piece of media of the Victorian or Edwardian era, Bartitsu and the notion of Bartitsu gets very popular. So if you recall the Sherlock Holmes films where you know, Robert Downey Jr. is doing what in the stunt team's opinion looks like Bartitsu, that suddenly gets a massive spike with people a, rubbish people at Bartitsu making Bartitsu videos, which is quite hilarious. You get people reading about it for the first time, exploring it, playing with it. So every time there's a piece of historical media from that era, there's a big spike in interest. You'll see the same with the Kingsman movies and pretty much everything from the Victorian period up to about the 1920s. You know, that's what makes people reinterested in Bartitsu. We see in the same trend when Game of Thrones is out or his historical epics, people suddenly want to learn longsword again. You know, so how the media portrays books and films and games has a real strong impact on what arts people want to study. And every time there's something Victorian or Edwardian, Bartitsu comes back on the agenda. I think that historical European martial arts are on the rise and they're becoming more popular, more mainstream. People are coming at it from the LARP community, so the live action role playing community. People are coming at it from the normal martial arts community. So you see people that would have historically done kendo suddenly go, oh, I could do German longsword. I could learn to use a mace. You know, people are finding that cool. They like the link that maybe one of my ancestors did something like that. You know, it's a very appealing prospect to people. So from a, from a British perspective, you know, people really enjoy the fact that Bartitsu is a, is a British martial art. It brings in Eastern martial arts, but it's made by a Briton for self-defense predominantly in London and people find that exciting and it's the same with historical pugilism people like the notion that you know for 300 years people have been boxing and fighting in this way you know that that's an exciting prospect so 
whilst I don't imagine it will ever be a mainstream martial art, there won't be hundreds of kids donning a but it's a Victorian piece of gear, putting on fencing masks and fighting with sticks or doing bare knuckle boxing. What I do see is that it becomes a part of the normalized martial consciousness. You know, we see the same rise in, you know, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, no one really focused on the Filipino arts apart from the Jeet Kune Do community. And then suddenly you can find Filipino martial arts in every major town, city, part of, part of the UK. I hope one day, you know, may, probably going to take 20, 30, 40 years, that historical European martial arts like Bartitsu have a similar following, a level of following. Um, I think people are more aware consumers now. Um, before, you did karate because karate was the thing in your leisure centre. Now there are more clubs than ever before and you can do virtual learning. People are freer to attend seminars. So people can be more discerning with this art really tickles my pickle. I like that one. I think that's really cool. You know, people can research the arts they like and go find it somewhere. And, and so that's why I see um, British, European martial arts really rising because people will be able to find it out, find a club, or indeed start a club. Importantly, historical European martial arts need to stop being the weird six-toed cousin of martial arts. Uh, often people that are in HEMA are only in HEMA and they'll only go to HEMA events. A lot of people are in other martial arts, so people that are into Filipino martial arts, Chinese martial arts, Korean martial arts, they will come together at events. So in the UK we've got something called Kaizen, there are other martial arts where people come together, learn and experiment, or at least appreciate each other. Um, at the moment now there's a big dichotomy between HEMA and other martial arts. So I think for it to really thrive, we need to proactively go out there, engage with people that like combat sports, that like Asian martial arts, and show them what we do, and help them explore and be more transparent and visible and present with the normal martial arts community. So I think from the historical European martial arts perspective, we need to get ourselves out there more, out to more normal martial arts events, to be in, in films and productions and programs. We need to put our name out there and be open to collaboration and exchange. So we need to stop being a closeted niche art and become more open and accepting and engaged with martial arts because in, and essentially we've got two arms, two legs. You like to fight wherever you're from in the world, wherever your art's from in the world. We need to work more together and engage with each other. And I think that's what will help it get to the next level of societal awareness and uptake. I feel that from my perspective, what I've brought to the Bartitsu scene, and it was already, you know, Bartitsu was, was a thing, you know, 20 years ago, way before I even got interested in it. I think what I've brought to it from my particular background is making it more combative. The original people that were engaged in Bartitsu were already pretty tough. So they could already box, they could already wrestle, they could already fence, they're used to pain and disruption and, and, and real visceral arts. They, they're used to combat sport arts. I think in the first wave of the Bartitsu revival, it was very soft very academic, very nuanced. People that are very much into steampunk or cosplay or LARPing, you know, they like to dress up and they like the dandified approach. But in reality, Barton Wright's making a system for street self-defense. If you're a gentleman studying Bartitsu at the time and you find yourself attacked by five angry dockers, it's not going to look elegant or nuanced. It's fighting, fighting is fighting. You're gonna be punching people in the throat. You're gonna be slamming people's heads into the ground. It's gonna be messy and dirty and visceral and painful. So what I bring to it is the realism of the combat sports world. I like to make it back like original authentic Bartitsu by making sure it's got some edge. I believe, you know, for my Bartitsu, because for my students, they should be able to go to a boxing gym anywhere in the country and comport themselves well. They should be able to throw hands, throw leather. You know, they should be able to go to a judo dojo and not be made to look a fool. They should be able to grapple. They should be able to go to a Krav Maga gym and be able to fight and defend themselves in a practical and realistic way. So for me, making Bartitsu real, something that you know, you can train someone and then go and defend themselves is really important and that's where my combat sports background really plays a big role in my approach to Bartitsu. I like to make it more real. I like to call it the daughter test. If I had a daughter and she was going somewhere dangerous in the world, what type of Bartitsu would I teach her? Would I teach her that this kind of dainty wrist lock is going to defend you from, from this big angry man? No, it's not. Is punching him in the throat, kneeing him in the balls and slamming his face into the ground, is that going to work? Yes, it is. So I want to make sure that it's got integrity. I'll, if I'm going to give that, I'm in a position of trust as a Bartitsu coach. So if I'm packaging something as self-defense, you've got to be able to use it for self-defense. And that brings it full circle back to the origin story and original approach of Bartitsu. It's not designed to be an academic exercise. It's designed to work, to keep you safe. So if you want to get into Bartitsu, there's loads of ways you can do it. I'd say, first, 
look around to see if you've got a nearby Bartitsu club. You know, easy enough to do. There's Bartitsu.org, there's the Bartitsu club. You know, if you, if you Google it, the first three search results should take you to what clubs there are. But I'll warn you that there's probably only 10 to 15 clubs in the entire world. So the chances of you having one near you are unlikely. So you're then faced with two options. If you're a skilled martial artist, if you're a skilled boxer, skilled wrestler, skilled fencer, you can pick up the guides. So you can pick up my new book, you can pick up the source material, you can pick up the antagonistics, and you could start to build your own Bartitsu club. You know, and I would advise you reaching out to the HEMA community. It's easier to convince people that are already used to revived martial arts to try Bartitsu than it is normal martial artists, but, but try everywhere you can. So if you're an experienced martial artist, pick up the source material, pick up new material, and give it a go. Throw yourself in, make a club, attend seminars. You know, there's lots of videos out there on YouTube, guides and other instructors, all of which are very helpful and happy to help. Now, if you're not an experienced martial artist, don't go and set up your own Bartitsu club. It's not worth it, you know, you don't need to share your inexperience. So what I'd say is, go find modern equivalents of what Barton Wright had access to. Go to a boxing gym, it's really cheap and they're everywhere. Go to a judo dojo, it's really cheap and they're everywhere. Go to Krav Maga, go to Savat. Look at all the arts of Bartitsu and see what's near you and get competent. You need to be competent in each of the constituent arts before you can really properly weave it together. So if you are experienced, go to the source material, start a study group, reach out to other instructors. If you aren't experienced, go get those single skill experiences and then reach out to the community who will help you weave it together in a Bartitsu-like fashion. But the most importantly is be brave and give it a go. Throw yourself into it. It's an open source martial art. No one owns it. There's no hombu. There's no group dojo. You can do with it what you like. So throw yourself in and make Bartitsu unique to you. Make it something which benefits how you want to defend yourself. It's got the word tits in it. Everyone loves that. <laughs>